Welcome everyone. My name is Carla Abreu and I'm Community and Program Manager at Singularity University of Portugal, working together with Nova Business School of Economics in this initiative. I have the pleasure to be your host for today's webinar, Navigating VUCA with Experimentation, an initiative that is part of the Role to Play campaign promoted by Nova Business School that aims to help our community to deal with the several challenges that we have in the current context. This session will be presented by Greg Schering, our innovation expert and also a member of Singularity University Portugal. Greg is an engineer who has worked in Silicon Valley, helping startups to establish their businesses. He has been working in the online world, contributing with expertise in several universities and research labs. These days, he's rebuilding retail ecosystem as senior principal engineer at Farfetch. How can organizations lead in a VUCA world? Are they prepared? How can they prepare themselves for the better future? These are some questions that Greg will answer. Finally, some technical information. Feel, please feel free to use the Q&A area in the bottom of the screen to ask questions that will be answered in the end of the session. The chat is mainly used for technical issues. And now to learn more about the topic of this session, I'll leave you with Greg. Thank you, Carla, and thank you, everyone, for uh, spending some time with us and, and talk about how we might uh, be able to support our community in the, the coming COVID uh, crisis and how we recover from that. Um, I first, let me start the screen share here for the uh, slides, but let's first take a look at the poll and see what you all had voted on. Okay, we can see sort of a nice distribution. In fact, we see a little bit waiting towards the next 12 months and a drop off after that. What we've just participated in is essentially a sort of electronic uh, version of uh, an experiment. We are dealing with the fact that there's a lot of diverse viewpoints, different lives, different perspectives that each of us have. And while this might be a very simple example, it, it demonstrates how it kind of gives us a better view of how the collective is experiencing the current crisis that we're in. So what I plan to do is uh, my thesis for you is three points. One is that VUCA is now defining many of our personal organizational and global challenges. Um, a second point is that working within these VUCA environments that are becoming to dominate our, our, uh, our businesses, our lives, it requires some mindset set and some organizational shifts. And last, and not least, is certainly that experimentation is the essential practice in a VUCA environment to be able to navigate it, uh, given all the complexities and uncertainties of it. So when we talk about VUCA, let's go just to start, just a, uh, a review. Uh, VUCA was a term that was in, uh, coined by the uh, American intelligence after while well, the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union. However, it came to dominate a description of what businesses and, and uh, economy was, were experiencing by the beginning of the millennium. Uh, VUCA standing for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And one of the best tools I've found to actually how to navigate that is something called the Kinevin framework. Kinevin is a Welsh word, comes from its, uh, its creator, which is Dave Snowden. Uh, he was a knowledge uh, management expert at IBM when he came up with this. And essentially, as you see, it's sort of in four quadrants and not like typical management consultant. It's a little bit organic in its shape. And, and that's for a good reason, because this is a sense-making framework. This is this idea of how you think about where you are and the kind of tool sets you use to solve the problems you have. So you start with the middle, which is disorder. And that's where you start where you don't really have any uh, idea of where you are. Um, and on either side, you see sort of more in the unpredictable zone and on the predictable zone on the, on the right. So we'll start with sort of what's called obvious or clear. This is where there's clear cause and effect, where uh, the practice is usually to sense, categorize, respond, and this is sort of best practice. This is a lot of sort of early industrial economy where you know that the best way to actually get greater efficiency is to work with your tool and die and, and essentially come up with a component that has a much greater tolerance and you can kind of make it more efficient. And so there's a lot of... Um, Practical uh, here is where things are just more on the obvious side. More on the complicated side, which is probably getting closer to what people are used to in their lives, um, is where cause and effect reads, needs a little bit of an expertise. Because what we're dealing here with is causality. When, when something happens, 
what happens in response? What actions can we take that actually cause something to change, whether it for better or for worse? And the way that this works is more in a sense, analyze, and respond uh, practice. So this is where you need an expert usually to kind of step in. There are different experts, there are different uh, businesses or scenarios, and so therefore it's a good practice kind of economy, not necessarily a best practice one. Now, here's where it gets more interesting and where I feel like more of us are experiencing today in our lives, and that is this complex space. This is where cause and effect, you can only actually tell in hindsight, you're dealing with so many moving pieces that it's almost impossible to reconstruct and predict really where things will end up. So this is the, the world of social networks, of climate change. It's the world of systems thinking and not necessarily being able to reduce things as we see in the predictable side. And the answer for this is really to kind of what's called probe, sense, and respond. Essentially, this is experimentation. This is essentially how basically the, um, someone raised their hand, but um, this is how we basically will navigate this area because the way to actually deal with the environment is to be able to kind of navigate it through uh, making different experiments and learning from it. And this is the area of what's called emergent practice. Uh, last but not least is sort of the chaotic. It's, there's no cause and effect. Uh, you have to just simply act, sense and respond. It's sort of the stop the bleeding and then try to be able to kind of recover with some novel practice that would never work in the same situation or even the same time again. And if we look at COVID-19, here's some examples. And um, the obvious ones are like wash your hands, stay at home. But interestingly enough, things like conspiracy theories, well, like things like fake news are often experiments to learn what sort of rumors and myths can, can propagate. Conspiracy theories actually try to simplify the world in a way that makes it easily explainable and obvious in a way, even if it's not true. And that's why they work for a lot of people. Um, complicated, we have things like the COVID dashboards, wearing masks and gloves. Some of that's now becoming more into that simple domain because we're becoming more obvious about what the best practices are. Um, but getting into complex, it's like how we do vaccine trials. How do we know if they're effective or not? Are they safe or not? Uh, lifting lockdowns, it's a complex situation we're facing. Things like uh, how do you pivot your business when suddenly nobody can walk into your store? And then in the chaotic space, we have a lot of techniques like self-quarantine. You're basically just doing a very brute force way of preventing uh, circulation of the virus. Um, and then hoarding behavior is also another sort of unpredictable outcome. So the, this idea of doing experiments to deal with sort of complex environments, environments actually even includes things like agile development or, uh, or being an agile company uh, for those who are familiar with it. And let me explain sort of for those who aren't maybe as familiar with like the actual ideals of agile is um, you could think of agile development as a form of experimentation. So over time, we have one direction and we have our dimension, we'll call it feature space. And feature space is probably multi-dimensional, but for the sake of illustration, we're, we're putting it on a single dimension here. And so what you usually start with is what you think your customers want. And this is like waterfall model. So you basically make a beeline for how do you get there? You come up with documentation about explicit requirements, explicit designs. And then essentially this is what's called putting constraints on it and you kind of in a software world, this would be called building the software right. The challenge is, there's two main problems with this, and that is you build the software right, but do you build the right software? And the first challenge is you're dealing with the fact that you are learning along the way as you're going, and you're not incorporating that in terms of how the direction you want. The other one is your market's changing in the background. And so because of this, you see agile development typically takes what's called sprints and they're often little iterations and essentially end up where we feel like the customer is actually much more, uh, their needs are met. And this is the same rationale behind things like minimum viable startups, lean, lean startups. It's the idea of having uh, oxygen hit the, uh, you know, of the air uh, to make sure it sees the light of day and get the response. Uh, I would argue that this is something that the Portuguese have a bit of a history with. Now, in 1415, when a lot of the discoveries had, had started overseas, Portugal didn't even know India existed. So before Vasco da Gama actually ended up on the discovery of the route for it, we only knew that essentially the Ottoman Empire had control over spices and things, and we wanted to make sure that um, you, you take different... Now, granted, the experiments that were done here are a much longer scale than, say, on software projects, even though some might not feel like it. Uh, but, but essentially, it's the same idea. How do you get to the unknown? 
How do you figure out where that is? And how do you do sort of probing ways of getting there? This is changing how basically management actually works. So if you look at a lot of uh, typical, uh, say, call it mid-level management, usually they're spending their time and their focus on a time horizon that's sort of mid-level and looking at things like quarterly goals, quarterly reports. What VUCA and then being an experimentation mindset to address it does is inverts that. Essentially, you start with an articulated long-term vision. So this is trying to figure out where the spices come from um, uh, in, in Vasco da Gama's case. Uh, reducing the midterm planning and analysis and focusing, focusing instead on small, uh, small short-term experiments. The idea that when you do something, does you want more like this? Is it taking you in the direction you want or is it taking you in another direction? Can you pull back? And that's what you kind of iteratively learn. And it's creating an environment of learning organizations about how we navigate this. This is uh, a, a diagram here from, uh, from ThoughtWorks, who I really like a lot of what they do. And you see from planning to experimentation as the fourth one. But these are sort of some of the organizational things we're seeing in general. And there's a reason for this. And VUCA is actually playing a large role of that. Uh, we see certainly in, say, leadership values, diversity, for example. Diversity being a way to get uh, different uh, points of opinion because we are all connected and therefore we need to have the, the, the opinions and thoughts of people who are much more broadly represented. Things like psychological safety is very important in an organization that's, that's dealing with VUCA. The reason is, is that if we're always learning, we always are going to be making mistakes. And so one of the, f the problems with, say, hierarchical traditional leadership is you often have this thing what's called the hippo or the highest paid person's opinion is once you kind of come across things like data, as we've seen, and, you know, I'm, you can probably tell from my accent I'm from the United States and there's some questions about some of the leadership and how they respond to data or whether they know better. And that doesn't always work out well. And uh, so you have to have psychological safety so that you aren't necessarily the expert in your company, but there's ways of bringing data in and you can make better decisions and people can kind of take risks. And the experiments you do are really kind of safe to fail risks. They're, they're risks that are not going to take your whole company down if something doesn't go right, but it's small enough and incremental enough that you can learn from and be able to respond to. Um, and then learning organizations. This is also resulting in value transitions, like uh, being able to go from knowing answers uh, and assuming that you know it better to asking questions, being able to ask better questions or things like going from an individual mindset to one of uh, thinking in teams, thinking of systems, thinking of ecosystems, which are all these great forces that we're experiencing more and more as our uh, companies run against things like climate change and, 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 and social networks. So how do you break down an experiment? This is, um, the reason I picked this diagram is it actually came from a, a, a children's website for how to basically do the scientific method. And the, the great deal is this still works. This is what actually at Farfetch, and I work in digital experimentation, we follow pretty much almost to a T, the exact same procedure. So one of the key pieces of this is having a hypothesis. Uh, and for those who don't remember, it's like starting with an insight, you propose a change that you wanna make, so you're looking for causality, and then you, you wanna figure out a behavioral change you wanna see in response, and then based on a certain insight, you wanna have some measurable impact. So this is where being a digitally um, uh, transformed company where you're collecting big data metrics can really help because this is a way for you to get more quantitative information, though it's still possible to do this at a qualitative way. And so hence with randomized control trials, so the idea of taking a treatment A and a treatment B, having them both done in parallel where there's a random choice between which one they belong to. This is how we do vaccine tests. This is also how we do A-B tests on the, on the internet. This is how a lot of, uh, this is the gold standard really for uh, a lot of testing and being able to look at experiments. And with hopefully we're not gonna tune out too many people in terms of actually some of the, the statistical things, but for those, when you do have um, the statistics behind it, there's a few things to kind of be aware of when you are looking at it. You're looking at um, what's often considered statistically significant. There's this sort of 95% significance threshold. And this is the idea that what you've observed from your change is likely due to the nature of the change itself rather than just some random chance because that could happen. You could flip a coin five times and it could come up heads. But you have to make this balance between having false positives and false negatives. So you want to statistically have some boundaries so that you don't want to have your buy set so high that like only like explosive 
possibilities get through and you never real, really pursue things that are actually kind of impactful. And you don't want it so low that sort of just even the weak and bad ideas are things you're spending time pushing through. There's other sort of uh, important things here like your sample size, how, how quickly you can get to, so how long do you have to run this? This is an issue. Um, being able to prioritize aligned tests. So if you have like a, a, a common metric that you do as a business, whether it's uh, the number of customers or revenue per customer, et cetera, having your tests aligned to how you influence that is very key. And um, also being able to uh, qualify them with better tests. So the more tests in, it's garbage in, garbage out. So that you want to make sure that you've gone through the homework of coming up with better tests so that you know that if there are some that are going to be false positives, you set your buy higher enough that you're not letting just anything through. One of the things that used to frustrate me, frustrate me like 20 years ago was working in uh, a lot of internet companies where they used to talk about taking spaghetti and throwing it at the wall and seeing what sticks. And that's just absolutely the worst way to do an experiment. Um, and then uh, we'll also talk about, um, well, there's also importance of having secondary metrics so you know that you're not having some uh, side effects, some, some guardrails, uh, and then making atomic changes. So when you make a change, if you do five in a row and if something happens that's good, you don't know which of those five things actually did it. So it's important to break down your tests. Uh, Harvard Business Review, their cover story for this uh, last month and this month is actually a culture of experimentation. And... Uh, this is uh, some of the insights that I have just in working with cultures and experimenting. And one is you have to think more in terms of probabilities. We, we're already doing this. It's an amazing thing just to see. We know people who talk about flattening the curve. We have people who understand the, 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 the different COVID databases. These are all basically a reflection of a, almost a greatest social experiment right now to kind of learn more about probabilities. Um, there's a challenge to a traditional authority. There are people who... In my case, when I talk about the highest paid person's opinion, um, a lot of, you know, sometimes you come culturally across people who have made it their career stake that they're, they know their product, they know their market, they know, and they're always right. And it takes a kind of humility to say, look, you know, sometimes you could be surprised. And in fact, when even we do experiments and a lot of digital experiments usually have a success rate between 10 to like 20 or 30 percent. So this is how common being wrong is. Um, good ideas should come from everywhere. Again, this doesn't necessarily make it go to the top who has the good ideas. You want to be able to reach out in that diversity of your organization and, and bring that forward. Um, a culture of learning versus a culture of winning. This is an important one because we want to encourage people in the act of learning, which means that you will make mistakes. And we don't, and so sometimes I've even found in my cultural examples, we learn the most from the most spectacular failures because we've been able to look at the data and, and kind of with context figure out what might have happened. And those have been some great insights. Uh, so you want to necessarily encourage more of that and not make people sheepish about trying some bold ideas because you need those. Um, and then this idea of being data informed versus data driven is very important because data-driven means there's no brain working in once you actually see the data. And I've worked enough in in basic science, et cetera, to see you can get the data to say anything you want to. So context means a lot. And so therefore, having that human in the loop. And the important thing also about this is we talk about COVID now, but we've also talked about AI and robotics taking our jobs, right? And the, the ability to, to ask these experiments and do and collect data is like one of the most renewable human uh, tasks that we can do that is very future-proof in that aspect. Um, so that was my thesis, uh, and I wanted to leave you with one last thing, and that was, I was looking at quotes where, you know, you had Jeff Bezos talking about experiments, but I didn't think that was as inspiring because we've probably all seen them, but this is actually from uh, Sister Mary Corita Kent. She was an uh, amazing artist in the 1960s and was a contemporary of Robert Rauschenberg, and, and she um, not only was an artist, but she was a nun, and so... The fact that she became one of the, the, the most notable um, uh, artists in her, in her time as someone who was both a woman and a nun is pretty impressive. And one of her favorite quotes is to treat everything like an experiment because that's how we learn and we need to embrace it. So I'm wishing you all to, to do some experimentation and, and, and learn a lot. So with that, we'll just kind of go to our questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Greg, for your knowledge and sharing this, all these informations with us. Let's just check here the Q&A. We have a question here. So um, 
which strategies do you think are more important to be taken in consideration in procurement and purchasing in the VUCA world? <laughs> wow, uh, I might not have a good answer for that. The, the, in a VUCA world, I mean, particularly given the situation now, yeah, I mean, if I, I'm a believer that you should try experiments wherever you can. And again, that's the important part was the safe to fail. Um, if there are ways that you may be qualitatively, because usually with purchasing, you're probably not buying enough of a volume to be in the quantitative space. Um, maybe qualitatively is to try some things out, uh, take some smaller risks, see what actually sort of works and, and then use that as maybe not the most statistically significant information, but a way of being able to learn and try things. This is the amazing thing about what's happening now. Every time I walk through here in Lisbon, I see a, a, a restaurant or storefront, everybody's experimenting. They're figuring out how to open, how they're going to receive customers, how they're going to take payment. We're all learning. So this is as good a time as ever for us all to be able to join in on that. Yes, those, these specific times are difficult to experiment at, but anyway, we have to try it. Exactly. <laughs> we have another, more que another question. When you shift from hier hierarchy to network, do you think that it's crucial to define the role of each individual? <laughs> um, I, that's a good question. I think there's a lot of strength in self-organization. That's a very important detail about this. And granted, you don't want to run into situations where there's the missing thing, but this is where teamwork really kind of comes in. And, and usually you have team players, they will identify a missing need and they'll volunteer in. And, you know, usually as a manager, hopefully you don't have to step into that. But I would say that I would be less... I would be more reluctant of trying to define hard rules. I mean, I think you want to define responsibilities, but in terms of like people being categorized into roles, I think that can actually limit some of your effectiveness because a lot of the collaboration that comes out of this is encouraging people to kind of cross over and, and share that diverse perspectives that they have. Okay, we have one more question here and I think it's quite interesting. Do you think that countries are more prepared for VUCA situations right now? Some countries is, is um, I would, that's a good question. I, I think, and I think the answer is a little bit more deceptive than you think. I think there's a lot of natural Western viewpoints that might look at some countries in Africa and sort of say, wow, you know, uh, their healthcare systems are not set up for this, etc. But you know what? They are actively involved in experiments all the time. I mean, if you've ever wanted to see creativity, go to a, a, you know, an, an African uh, backcountry and, and watch how a community tries to fix um, a water supply. It's, it's, it's amazing how resourceful can be, people can be. So I don't necessarily feel like there's a lack there that it has to be Singapore or, or whatever. So some countries are definitely better than others. Uh, I would almost say in some ways there might actually be some advantages to being some of the less developed ones because the ones who are very rules based, those are all about efficiency and efficiency right now is working against us because resilience is what's really becoming important. And so there's that balance that you have between the two. So I would say if the ones who are best prepared for, for VUCA are probably the ones who have a little more resilience in them and aren't all baked into efficiency. Yes. Okay, we still have time for one last question and also links with this last one, but I think it's important. How to drive the organization culture from achievement to innovation? Uh, organizations now are more focused on the now and machines and they just want to make money. So how can they do this swift? <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, one of the big underlying themes here is trust. Um, and the, there's, a, there's a challenge with that because there's a, a, a tug of war about do I trust you? Do I deserve trust? But, but you know, at some level, I, I think to really be good at this, employees respond really well when they're actually entrusted to do things as, as opposed to just execute on what's kind of given in front of them. And that top-down model, it's great, but it creates 
people who are acting no better than robots and we treat them like robots. And I feel like in a modern economy, that's not necessarily going to be good for the worker. It's not going to be good for the employer. I think we have so many issues coming at us and different threats and opportunities that only if you have your ear to the ground for people who are feeling self-empowered and being able to have some structure, some maybe some constraints and some, some responsibilities. But if there's some flexibility in there, I think they could they could do better to, to be able to help. So what that does mean is that you're going to lose direct control of your, uh, your, your revenue in a sense, but you want to be able to be innovative. You have to feel a balance between things that you know that you have to do and things that you want to keep doing to renew the, 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 the potential of your company and what it needs to do in a future time horizon. So I think you have to do a little of both. Okay, so this, this was the last question. I, I would just like to remind that all the, the questions that were not answered, we will reply by emails and giving the answer that Greg will help us to, to respond. Thank you, Greg, once more for your participation at this webinar. That I remind it's part of the role to play campaign promoted by NovSBE. Um, and I would like also to remind that all the sessions are being recorded and are available at roll2play.novspe.pt. Um, thank you for being with us. Tomorrow we'll have a new session at 6 p.m. Uh, with Constanza Casquinho that will be talking about mindfulness at peaceful revolution. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Thank you all for your attention. Bye bye.